and welcome to Vox Markets. I am John Human, and I'm joined once again for our regular macro catch up with Jamie Constable of Singer Capital Markets. How are you doing, Jamie? Hello, great to see you again, John. Yeah, you too, you too. Um, yeah, so interesting, uh, lots of interesting stuff going on in the macro front, particularly uh, on, on inflation, where we're seeing a sort of a bit of a divergence between, between the UK and the US. Fill us in what, on what's been going on. Well, basically, I think we, we've got this divergence in markets, really, and uh, the influence seems to be coming back across the Atlantic towards the UK for the first time in almost what feels like a generation, I suppose. Uh, we've got US uh, inflation moved up the last reading, 3.2 to 3.5, uh, whereas UK, we've still got inflation coming down, 3.4 to 3.2. And as we've talked about at length is, you know, previously, we see it falling rapidly now with the energy price cap uh, adjustment coming into the April number out in May, uh, back probably below the 2% target that, for, that the Bank of England have and the MPC. So I think what that's doing for markets is we've seen this change really in, uh, in, in, in direction, really, where the US, we've seen some profit taking, Magnificent Seven finding it a bit harder to move forward, uh, whereas UK, we're now finally uh, it's been taking a long time as well for that. We're seeing the FTSE 100 hitting all, uh, new all-time highs on a daily basis. Well, two or three days now, but yeah, that's yeah. Okay. I hope it keeps going. Well, this all, that sort of coincided with with what I, I think has been a sort of a barrage of commentary about what what a terrible, terrible position the UK market's been in. I mean, what, what was this sort of the point of maximum pessimism for the UK? Do you think? I think so. I think we've it's it's not been easy. Obviously, mm. we've had you know. You had the, the vote on Brexit. Then you've had, obviously, various political uh, uh, problems. Obviously, the growth's not been great in the UK uh, either. So we had that. We had issues with growth in the UK. Uh, but that was that was the same globally, to be perfectly honest. Um, but on top of that, you obviously had flows, flows coming out of equities. Uh, and as we always say, I always say, flows move markets. So flows were coming out from pension funds, uh, but now they're down to about 3%. That's kind of ameliorated. But, but what really moves markets nowadays are these global macro funds. The global macro funds running billions, even trillions of uh, dollars out there now. If they decide they want to buy a market, they will move it. Quite, they can move markets quite quickly. And what we've seen in the UK now is that the attraction of the valuation, obviously M&A has continued to pace. I mean, what was it? 117 companies disappeared last year. We're continuing to pace this year. It's knocking on two a week again this year. So that's reduced the pool of companies to invest in, but also has shown the attraction of the valuation of UK assets. Uh, within that, so if you look at the FTSE now, the banks have rallied hard. Commodity stocks are starting to, starting to pick up on hope for uh, improvement in industrial demand. We'll come on to maybe uh, PMIs in a minute. And how that's not really being seen in construction PMI in the manufacturing PMIs at the moment. But that driver now seems to be moving towards money, uh, well, definitely seem to moving towards flows into UK equities. Flows move markets, starts in the FTSE, FTSE's up, what, four and a half year to date now. The 250's up year to date, the small caps up year to date, AIM's not quite made it yet. But we'll see that trickle down now, I think, from as long as it continues, which we expect it to, from the FTSE, then it will trickle down into the mid cap and into the small cap uh, as asset allocators put more money into the UK market. Yeah, yeah. And how much does that to do with this sort of you know, diverging in, inflationary uh, uh, outlook that we have at the moment? Is, you know, is, is the sort of new attraction of the UK that, that, that perhaps we, we are in a, a, a bet more likely position to see rate cuts? I think so. I think I, I certainly think that the Bank of England should already have been cutting interest rates, as I've said at length. Uh, I think what we're seeing now in the US with that inflation pick up and obviously Powell's recent comments, that's pushed out the chance for rate of rate cuts in the US. So they've they've got a meeting next week, May the 1st. Uh, no chance for a rate cut there from what they've said recently. Uh, their next meeting after that, let me just check my don't want to get the wrong date here. Their next meeting after that is the 12th of June. Then you've got the 31st of July, and I've spoken before about, and maybe Mark has forgotten about this a, a bit because we haven't seen it so long, that the Fed will go into Perda ahead of the US presidential election. Mm -hmm. So it's questionable whether that 31st of July meeting is live. Certainly, meeting after that aren't live ahead of the election. So 
you were really pushing out the chance of rate cuts in the US. Beginning of this year, we had six or seven cuts being forecast by the uh, uh, interest rate futures. It's now down to two, maybe even one. You flip back to the UK, in, uh, inflation is falling. As we said, it's going to hit 2% or less uh, in the April number announced in May. Very positive on that, fr on that front. The Bank of England should be looking forward. And I do find it quite perplexing and to be frank, annoying in some of the commentary that's coming out from the Bank of England uh, and the other economists on the MPC at the moment, where they kind of say, well, I'm worried about Middle East could hit inflation. Really, they should be talking, they should be on an easing bias now. They should be looking at easing rates because we're, growth's not great. Inflation on all their forecasts is going to get down to two and probably below two. If something came left field to worry inflation, you can easily reverse that cut, a cut if you put a cut through. Mm. They should be looking forward, they should be cutting rates now and helping what is a nascent recovery in the UK, as we've seen in the latest GDP numbers. I mean, it's not much to write home about. It's 0.1, 0.2 or something like that in terms of monthly GDP growth. But they need to, they need to nurture that and get growth moving uh, at, rather than worrying about something left field. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned nascent signs of, uh, of of economic recovery in the UK. One of the things that, that I know you've uh, you've been looking at closely is uh, services PMIs. Um, mm. Now, now they they're looking pretty good. Yeah, so we've had six months now of the UK PMI services above fifty, which everyone knows above fifty signals expansion. Now, if you look back pre pandemic, which you have to do on the PMIs because obviously they distorted it so much. Between about uh, the, the ten years prior to there. If you had a PMI of around services of around 53, 54 or 54 or above 54 even, that was equivalent to one and a half to two two and a half percent annualized GDP growth in the UK. Now, the latest flash number for April was 54.9. And it's been around 53, 54 during that period. And as I said, just said, we've had six months of positive numbers. There's no, no one is forecasting GDP growth at that level in the UK as we sit today. But we've had six months. That, for me, is long enough to start factoring that into upgrades to be coming through for GDP growth in the UK going forward. And just to remind people, services is 80% of the UK economy. You hear, you hear people talking about a manufacturing-led recovery in the UK, but manufacturing would have to be going like a train for that to happen because it's only 10% of the economy. So just to recap, 53, 54 level on PMI services is 1.5% to 2.5% GDP growth. That's very positive. And I think that is also driving those flows into the UK market. As people look at this and go, hang on, that's looking really good from a uh, growth point of view. And funnily enough, the PMIs, flash PMIs for US that came out yesterday fell back towards the 50 level. I mean, the US data is very difficult to call at the moment. I mean, a lot of the growth is being driven by, um, by the, the government spending programs. But that really, I think, is driving those flows into the UK. And funnily enough, Europe uh, yesterday and their PMIs, manufacturing PMIs still in the doldrums, but actually the PMI services picked up enough to get the composite PMI for Europe back above 50 as well. So, yes, I think the picture, the outlook is looking stronger and stronger for the UK economy uh, for as long as these PMIs stay where they are. And what we need now is just that interest rate cut, because that will help the mortgage market, of course, because you know, say they were to cut by 25 basis points, you won't get that on mortgages, but you probably get 15 off mortgages or off mortgage rates or something like that, just to help stimulate it at the right time of the year in the spring selling season, which is OK. We've seen it from company comments recently. It's it started OK. It's all OK. But the economy just needs a little bit more help because I'm not a big believer in real rates because you and I don't look at what's the real rate on of interest do it in, when I'm making a decision of when I'm going to buy something but if we've got interest rates at five and a quarter and CPI is going to fall below two that's real rates of three over of, 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 of three over three percent in an economy that needs a boost mm -hmm. you could argue that real rates should be more like one percent yeah. Do you, do you think there's a, a slight worry, though, w within the Bank of England, perhaps that that, you know, the, the PMI is running hot is going to is going to discourage them from that rate cut? They could do that. <laughs> you, you, it's a good point. John. It's a good point. I mean, it's 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 also good. We don't need to cut rates. I mean, maybe they would say that. But I don't think we, we're not I don't think we we're not seeing inflation coming through. I mean, food inflation is falling back, falling back to the threes now. 
Um, you're seeing deflation in certain food items. If you look at insurance, if you look at the year and year number, it's a huge number. I mean, twenty yeah, percent car insurance, every I've just home renewed. insurance, car insurance. We're all seeing it. Yeah, I've but just actually, renewed. It's now, awful. oh, it's huge. But on a monthly <laughs> basis now, it's it's eased that it's it's eased off now. It's not really increasing anymore. So that services led inflation is coming off. What they will worry more about, of course, is the uh, uh, moves like the living wage, which has come through. Uh, but that's happened now. We knew it was going to happen. It's happened. That's gone through and will pass through. And all the companies we're speaking to this so far, apart from the ones that are uh, exposed to living wage, but they expect to be able to offset that with other gains internally. So they don't really see you know, energy prices falling, for example. So they don't really see them having to push prices up too much. Companies are talking about three to four percent wage rises this year, uh, and you've got to remember that the, the numbers you see on wages are very are real lagging numbers. They're, they're three months average, looking back historically, and we have annual wage rounds, so we won't really see it till the middle of the year what wage growth is going to look like this year. We see, I don't see it as a problem. We don't see it as a problem this year. Wage growth that will make a step down on twenty twenty three numbers. So yes, I mean they should be cutting rates to bolster that economy, and I think that's what. Um, that is what asset allocators will be looking at, and these global macro funds. They're looking at the relative performances of relative of, for markets. US probably coming off election, et cetera, et cetera. Inflation going up in the US, inflation coming down in the UK, interest rates coming down in the UK potentially should coming down before the US. I mean, the next UK meeting is May the 9th. The, Fed, the ECB have basically said, you know, we are going to cut in June. Uh, their meeting is their meeting is on uh, June the sixth. I mean, the UK just needs to get ahead of the curve and, and cut on May the 9th, Be the first to cut, uh, it, not globally, but the first to cut. Get ahead of the curve, and that will help the flows more. I think into the UK market by by doing that. We all know what the UK needs. You know what the UK needs to drive the economy and to drive markets. You know, which is what we're interested in. The UK needs growth. We need growth in the UK economy. So that's what we should be driving for. And then once people see growth, inward investment will pick up and you get into a virtuous circle where, as you said earlier, you know, when we were at the kind of it's darkest before the dawn, UK was there was no growth to be seen anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we need to see that come through. We need to see that to drive the market. Uh, and I, hopefully we are going to see that now. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, let's drill from the macro, perhaps a little bit into, into the micro. So, you know, US mm. yo yoing around, you know, perhaps, perhaps asset allocators are, are looking to move away from there. Europe still still somewhat wobbly, but the UK mm. yeah, potentially some good good uh, economic figures about to come through. Where should we be looking, uh, you know, in terms of where the flows might go in the UK uh, markets? What sort of, what sort of sectors yeah. are likely to be the beneficiaries of this? Well, I think what we're seeing already, what we've seen already is... If it's the large, you know, the first money goes into the FTSE, doesn't it? You, you need to get your money in, you go into the biggest part of the market, uh, you go into the large cap stocks. What we've seen, if it, the UK market's cheap. So if you're buying the UK markets because it's cheap, as, an, as let's say you're a North American-based investor, you're going to want to buy the cheap stocks in the cheap market, aren't you? So what have we seen? We've seen some big bank bounces in the banks. Look at uh, the bounce we've seen in Lloyd's. Look at the bounces we've seen in Barclays. So money's gone in there. Uh, if you're looking for global growth to pick up, commodities is another area you should be looking at. Metals prices have been picking up. But there's a little caveat on the commodity stocks that we're kind of bouncing around a bit at the moment. Copper's had a very good run, which is quite interesting. I mean, and copper should be in secular growth because of uh, electrolyze, you know, because of uh, electricity driving the world, decarbonization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but China's not driving much growth at the moment, uh, so you're not seeing a lot from there. But the rest of the world, if it picks up, should, should pick up. So commodities are cheap. They're, they're cheap stocks, big yields as well. So that's where it starts. But then it percolates down, I think, really. So they also like, prop, they, they call it property in North America. So obviously, but they mean house builders on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the house building season, the spring season has picked up quite nicely. We had a panel conference last week. Uh, with uh, companies speaking at the spring selling season has started. It's not, you know, we're not, you're not off the races. Let's be honest. It's not off the races, but the spring selling season is coming through okay. Um, and as I just said, it needs a little bit more help with an interest rate cut just to get the confidence going. So I think those are the areas you want to look at. Look at, if we're talking about the UK economy picking up, you've got to look at the UK domestics as well on that front. 
So AB Foods, we had a good statement yesterday, Primark, they upgraded. They're seeing their margins coming back strongly, very strongly. Why? Because the cost pressures are easing, freight costs are easing. So you look at factors like that. So consumer stocks in the UK, I think those are the areas you want to look at. The industrials I want to buy, but I'm still a little bit cautious just because, you know, the, in, the PM, industrial PMIs aren't picking up. I think what we need for them to pick up is we need to see those interest rates coming through in the UK, potentially in the US in due course and in Europe. And then we'll see the industrial PMIs pick up as well. So look for those domestics. Look for the bombed out stocks. What we're seeing in the market now is if a company comes out and says it's OK, no change to forecasts, then we're seeing big bounces in the share, in the share prices uh, because the, the ratings are so low. Mm. So look for the stocks on the, low, on the low ratings. There's still lots of sub 10 PE stocks out there. Look for those stocks. If they come out and say the world's OK, then you see 10, 15, 20 percent bounces in share prices. So that's where I'd be looking. Um, the UK is cheap. Look for the cheap stocks. Have that UK bias in terms of domestic exposure, uh, which can be all across the board. It doesn't have to be retail. It can be leisure as well, of course. Look for those stocks and look for the ones where they've been hit historically by cost pressures, but now there's cost pressures coming off. I mean, the oil price is up, of course. Oil price is up just because of geopolitical, but also mainly because OPEC are playing a game of cutting supply to keep the price high. But actually, it's gas that's much more important for UK and Europe nowadays. And the gas price is back to the level it was pre-Ukraine. Um, so that's, a, that's the main driver for uh, energy usage by industry nowadays. So again, that's a cost that's coming off for people as well. And as we've talked about, energy prices coming off for the consumer, they're coming off for the industry as well. Yeah, yeah. Lots, lots, so, of, uh, lots of reasons to be cheerful for the UK. Sorry? Lo lots of reasons to be cheerful and lots of areas where, I think there um, are, I think, where, where, where I think there's values to be found. Yeah, I think there are. And we're now seeing it. We're now seeing it with the, the indices starting to pick up. And again, why is that happening? Well, markets move because flows, money coming in, markets pick up. The one other thing we should mention is the Bank of England might be worried about is that if they cut rates, then the currency might fall. Um, I would kind of think somewhat different on that, that if growth's picking up and they cut rates, money should come into the UK rather than the currency fall at this stage in the cycle. Uh, because of course the currency falls, they're worried about imported inflation. So I would think the other way, cut rates actually help boost that growth. And then people say, actually, I wanna buy the UK. Because remember where people are coming from. People have been very underweight the UK. So they're not even going overweight at the moment. What they're doing at the moment is they're closing their underweight. But it won't take much because there's not going to be too many sellers around, uh, particularly with all the M&A that's happened and the pension funds down to 2 3% in UK equities for, to drive markets up. Because, as I say, you know, supply and demand work. There's not a lot of supply. Demand picks up, then share prices will move higher. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And one other sector that I know you mentioned in your uh, one of your notes this week, defence. Uh, we had some uh, we had some news on defence uh, spending plans mm. uh, yesterday. Very positive for that sector. Um, not everyone's a cup of tea, but 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 possibly a sector that you can't really avoid uh, at the moment. You've got to be overweight defence. I mean, I mean, it's by tw we're going to two and a half percent by twenty thirty, but it's a direction that counts, in, mm. in, as we all know. Um, and we've had some cracking performance from the likes of BAEs, Rolls-Royce, et cetera. We don't have that many defence stocks left in the UK. I think of stocks like Ultra that got electronics got taken out. So there's not that many left out there, but there still are some out there and companies that are exposed to defence through uh, as well. So, yes, I think, I mean, it's slightly sad we have to say this, but you, you've got to be exposed to defence uh, as the... Uh, uh, as, as when it was announced yesterday, we know what's happening out there. Uh, there's a kind of changing geopolitical balance going on, isn't there, with new groupings trying to uh, gain influence. And by doing that, uh, we've got a kind of rearmament, rearming going on. Um, and if Trump were to win in November as well, he will not force, but he will encourage uh, NATO members to all move up to 2.5% of GDP. So looking at that, you do not want to be underweight defence stocks because there's going to be continued uh, demand coming through 
uh, and it's just a great place to have your money at the moment. I'm even seeing that some of the ESG funds are saying defense is actually okay for ESG funds because of the, it helps by having defense, you lessen the chance of conflict. Yes, it's a deterrent. So it's a deterrent. Gone full circle, you see. Gone full circle. Green can own defense. I don't know. Absolutely. What a strange old world we live in. Um, but um, but we've at least made a little bit more sense of it uh, today. Thank you uh, once again, Jamie, and uh, uh, catch up soon. Thanks, John. Great Thank speaking you. to you. you Cheers. Too.